justice. No peace. No justice. We're at a time that we have never, ever been in in our society before. America understands that our policing system is broken and that we need radical change. Portland, Oregon, of all places, still one of the widest major places in our entire country, being at the center of the national imagination around the Black Lives Matter movement. It must be something going on where all these white people are woke and they're feeling what black people feel. George Floyd's death represented police brutality. I am no one out there. I am a random person who saw George Floyd's video and couldn't sleep. There's been a lot of narratives around peaceful, non-peaceful, violent, non-violent, and every protest is a voice of the unheard. If you think to yourself, like, looking at the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s, oh, I would have marched, I would have been at Selma, then you should be in the streets now, because that's what we're doing. When, you know, I saw the news about George Floyd, you know, my first reaction was, this is not the first time we've heard I can't breathe. So I had no reason whatsoever to think that the reaction to George Floyd's murder would be different than any other murder that's happened in Portland or, or, or the United States since the birth of our country. Clearly we were unprepared for the emotional combustion that took place. The night people broke into this building, tried to set fires, and people were out and uh, really wanted to have their voices heard, uh, standing up for you know racial justice and uh, police reform and things of that nature. It was wild to see the you know, city of Portland and Portland Police Bureau's reaction to the protests early on, curtailing and violating our constitutional rights. If you're in this part of the peaceful demonstrator and do not want to be subject to potential force, you have the opportunity to leave the area now. I first started coming to the protests when the marches were really big from Rev Hall. There were like thousands of people in the street then. It was really inspiring. George Floyd. Michael Brown, Trayvon Martin, Patrick Kimmins, Kevin Matthews, Sandra Bland, Eric Garner. To see two weeks later in Portland and still have 5,000 or more people showing up on a nightly basis really gave me a sense of nostalgia. It's time for you to rise up, exterminators and claim what belongs to you. And in the voice of the old civil rights song, you can't let nobody turn you around. We want justice! We want justice! We want justice! We want justice! It's about progress. And progress does not come easily. It's gonna take time. We're here for the long road. It's not a short game. This is war. Make no mistakes, this is war. Make no mistakes, this is war. Protest, riot, all of these things are voices of a community that has been let down, that has not been supported, that doesn't feel heard. And I'm not someone who personally is going to go and burn down a building, but I can understand why somebody feels like they need to burn a building down. Uh, our people have, have been the constant victims of brutality on the part of America's racists, and the government has found itself either unwilling or unable to do anything about it. So out of necessity, uh, we've reached the point now where 
our people must form self-defense units. People that act like a revolution is built strictly off the backs of rioting don't understand history. It's Malcolm and Martin. It's not just Malcolm. It always has been. So I need people to understand that there are multiple pillars underneath the house of this uh, uprising. This isn't a short process. This is always a long process. If you look at the history of the civil rights movement, almost none of those many protests lasted any shorter than like three to seven months. When they boycotted the bus system, that was 381 days, you know? I need people to understand that that, that kind of mental fortitude isn't something that most of us are used to having because we've had such luxurious lifestyles. And so I'm trying to get them in the mental headspace of, your feet are gonna hurt, you're gonna be tired. We're not here to be comfortable or happy. Black people have been marching for centuries about equality. So when you have more white people woken up here, you know, then it, it appears, then yeah, people are gonna notice. And Major John Cloud of the Alabama State Troopers. This is an unlawful march, it would not be allowed to continue. You should go back to your homes or return to your church. And Jose Williams said, Major, give us a moment to kneel and pray. And the Major said, Troopers advance. You saw these men putting on their gas masks. They came toward us, beating us with nightsticks, tramping us with the horses, and releasing the tear gas. We saw our police go out and use excessive crowd control tactics. And we're in the middle of a pandemic, a virus that literally attacks your respiratory system. And here we have police officers indiscriminately using tear gas against broad swaths of people, the vast majority of whom are not committing any form of vandalism whatsoever. We give people ample warnings um, before we use any force or any um, munitions and things of that nature. The best way to protect yourself is to listen to those warnings. We disperse when we tell you to disperse. For us, we don't really want to be using munitions against community members. It's just the, the violent acts, the acts that are criminal in nature, those are the ones that are problematic for us as a police organization. I completely support the goals and the aspirations of nonviolent demonstrators who want to see racial justice and equity, who want to see meaningful engagement of the public in police reforms. Unfortunately, the story has shifted, and the focus of the conversation has, uh, I think, somewhat distractedly become the question of nightly violence. What I mean by that specifically is, on one hand, the violence of those who are engaged in perpetrating uh, violence and criminal destruction. We've seen that. And on the other hand, there's also a legitimate question about police violence and police tactics. <laughs> Mayors and governors must establish an overwhelming law enforcement presence until the violence has been quelled. If a city or state refuses to take the actions that are necessary to defend the life and property, of their residents, then I will deploy the United States military and quickly solve the problem for them. We want to have a dialogue to make sure that we keep this peaceful and safe for everybody. Are you guys going to not fire tear gas at us when we do nothing? Hey, the question was, the question was about tear gas. Are you going to fire tear gas at us when we're not doing anything, when we're staying peaceful? Conversations are not super effective. Uh, when there is a whole group of people versus another person. It needs to be smaller. It needs to be maybe one-on-one. -on -one. The three sides of the perspective, I see this as being white, I see this as being black, I see this as being a police officer, and all I see out of it is division. And there's a point where we need to just have a conversation. It appalls me to hear Portland police characterize people as showing up to fight. 
those shields were self-protection. Those hockey sticks were self-protection, right? Bicycle helmets, self-protection, gas masks. I mean, what else do you do to protect yourself when you are being brutalized by people who are sworn to protect and serve you? We bring out this gear because unfortunately, you have to have armor now to exercise your First Amendment rights in this city. That's an incredibly sad state of affairs that you need to buy a gas mask and body armor and a shield. You know, we used to be able to come out dressed like I am, but then they started tear gassing crowds. And so people had to get respirators to try to protect themselves. And then they started shooting off concussion grenades and you start getting like knee pads and chest protection because that will hit you. Um, they started indiscriminately macing people. So now you need eye protection to go out. I do not like the tear of gas. I think it's ugly. It is not focused enough. What you gonna do about it? Seattle today, late this We're afternoon. We're not Seattle. We're not Seattle. the use of tear gas for 30 days except limited circumstances. We should do the same. Tomorrow, my colleagues and I will be making Tonight, tonight, tonight. My colleagues. Disperse the area now. CF's gas is being used. Disperse from the area. I was going to, uh, to a family member's house. So they were, they were, they were in the direction I was, I was going, basically. You're in your car. I didn't, I didn't think it was gonna burn and hurt me this much. I mean, I just, my eyes are so red and I, I, I'm just now breathing. Like, ugh, it's really, really sickening. I'm just now starting to feel a little bit better because I couldn't see, I couldn't breathe. I was hyperventilating and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, this is a whole lot. It's very, very, very uh, overwhelming. this to the level um, of having an international human rights organization come to Portland really was the sending of the federal officials. Right. These impact munitions, the class of rubber bullets, those are intended to be used from far away. They're really supposed to only be used if someone is being violent. Uh, it's supposed to be used as a last resort. But the problem is here, they're being shot indiscriminately against peaceful protesters. They're being used for dispersal. The medics were very scared that someone could die. the largest city in a state are all saying exactly the same thing, which is you're not invited, you're not wanted, you're not helping, we want you to leave. And they get defensive and locked down and say, well, the only reason we're here is because you're not doing your job. That's not a response, that's not a genuine opportunity to sit down and listen. This is a waste of time, waste of resource, and my biggest fear, honestly, is that somebody's gonna die. The night of July 12th, we had marched to the PPA, which is the police union. And so we had a line. One of the cops came up and shoved me with his baton a couple times and grabs my respirator, wrenches my head back. And I'm, I don't know what's happening at this point. Then I feel it come off and just wet all over my face and everything went black. And they want us to stop. They're trying everything they can to make us stop. And so we can't, we absolutely can't stop. They can't win with this.
I'm from Memphis, Tennessee, where Martin Luther King was killed. So I've been an activist my whole life. The reason why Portland is such a mecca for Black Lives Matter right now is because there's a majority of white people versus black people. So the world is kind of shocked. We knew there was a need for a group and the moms are fulfilling their needs to help with the Black Lives Matter movement and be with this revolution. That's why I love Portland, right? So when you tear gas moms, what happens? Twice as many people show up the next night, right? And you tear gas them again, and twice as more people show up the next night, right? So what 45 thought he was doing, which was intimidation and fear that would stop people from protesting, clearly he hadn't been to Portland before because Portlanders were not gonna take that sitting down. We do this every night. We had unnamed people from federal sources that were unnamed and they brutalized people. I mean, the amount of tear gas that they used on people, uh, what I know is that what he did was very dangerous to our community. Who do you protect? Who do you serve? Who do you protect? We're telling them right now that we're coming in very soon. The National Guard, a lot of people, a lot of very tough people. And these are not people that just have to guard the courthouse and save it. These are people that are allowed to go forward and do what they have to do to clean out uh, this beehive of, of terrorists. Black Lives Matter! Who's Black Lives Matter! So the significance of the different nightly action locations, they're, for the most part, they're precincts. So that's where the police operate from. It's, we're coming to them at work. But the reason why we center black lives is because in any form of oppression, if you are black, you are experiencing the worst form of that oppression. This is a riot. Disperse from the area now. Get out from the street now. Officers are taking lawful action. Get on to the sidewalk. When I think of a stopping point for this, for me personally, I don't see one until the Portland Police Bureau is no more. I've really been thinking more kind of long term. I think a lot of the things that need to happen really circle around trust. I want to have an organization that serves the community in order to have a really great police department. You need to invest and you need to train and um, look at ways to improve. And those you know, usually entail investment and additional money, not cuts. For weeks, I have been standing in front of the press and I've been saying my biggest fear is that ultimately somebody is going to die. And now somebody has. And I think it's important for all of us to now turn to the positive and work on ways that we can lift this community together. And I know that's what people want to do. I think that it's awful that it had to come to a point where somebody lost their life. 
My goal after this is to make it so that our country, this country, United States, is left to our children in a way that they're at peace with walking around, the laws are for us, and everything is, you know, peaceful. People are hungry for this conversation. I'm here to tell you that life will never be normal again because what we had before was an unjust system. And I have no desire to rebuild a system that did not work for all our community members. I'm very excited about building a more just, a more fair city. That's where we're headed.